Assalamu alaikum, this is Dr. Hasna with Hasna's Not Me, back with another video of your face, right? Today we're going to be discussing the clinicals of your face. Before I get started with the clinicals, let me give you a general rule that the major motor supply of your face, which is supplying all the muscles of the facial expression, chief supply is the facial nerve. It comes directly from the brain. This is known as the seventh cranial nerve. The chief sensory supply of the face is trigeminal nerve. Now, this nerve is, uh, we've already talked about, the fifth cranial nerve, and it is known as the CNV nerve. All right, important part about the trigeminal nerve, it has three chief branches which supply the face with sensory supply. These are the V1, V2, and V3. That being said, let's talk uh, about some clinicals of the face. Uh, let's begin with the danger area of the face first. So basically what happens is your facial vein that we discussed, the facial vein is basically, we all know that it's running uh, on the lateral side of the nose, on the medial angle of the lip, right? On both sides, uh, behind the facial artery. The point of your uh, nose area and your upper lip area, the facial vein is making a very important connection via the deep facial vein. So it makes this connection with the deep facial vein, which runs to the pterygoid venous plexus. Pterygoid venous plexus is responsible for sending an emissary vein and we all know what emissary veins are these connect the extracranial to the intracranial veins so this pterygoid venous plexus is sending an emissary vein inside to the cavernous sinus it is lying inside your cranial cavity and that is dangerous you can see that your basic benign facial vein has made a connection within your brain to the cavernous sinus this flow chart is very important from the facial vein to the deep facial vein to the pterygoid to the emissary vein and finally the cavernous sinus so if there's any infection of the nose or the upper lip area and if you attempt to pop any pimples over here which is like i can i'm even giving you an advice right now also some part of your cheek is also involved in this area if there's any pimple uh, do not pop it because any infection in the Facial vein, the flow is retrograde going behind towards your cranium. It has no valves in its flow. It is uninterrupted flow. So if there's infection over here, it will rapidly transfer to the cavernous sinus. And if it comes to the cavernous sinus, it causes thrombosis of the veins in the cavernous sinus. Thrombosis meaning clot formation. And if that happens, there is a serious emergency. It can lead to death. This is why this area of the face is known as the danger area of the face. Let's talk about the sensory supply of the face, which is the trigeminal nerve. All right. The trigeminal nerve at times in people who are mostly middle aged, so like, you know, 40 to 50 or even older than this, uh, they usually suffer from this disease called the trigeminal neuralgia. Anything that has the uh, suffix of algia means pain. All right. So there is pain in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. And since the trigeminal nerve supplying your entire face, there is pain in the distribution of your face. So your face in these people, they undergo paroxysms. These are basically sudden attacks of sharp pain within the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. And it's almost like 15 minutes long and people actually cannot bear it, even lead to suicide eventually. Like people really cannot deal with this pain. It's really bad. The most commonly affected division in the trigeminal neuralgia is the V2 division, the maxillary division. Why does this trigeminal neuralgia occur? There are theories of why it occurs. Uh, one theory is that it occurs because uh, the sensory route from where this originates uh, over there, there is demyelination of those axons. Another theory is that there might be an aberrant artery located where it is originating. So that artery is interrupting it, is uh, stimulating this nerve over there. Right? What's important is how to alleviate the trigeminal neuralgia. Um, there are many uh, things you can do. Uh, for instance, you can e do an infraorbital nerve block. Why do we do an infraorbital nerve block? We all know it's a branch of your trigeminal nerve. We can actually approach the infraorbital nerve uh, at the infraorbital foramen, which lies in the maxilla bone. So you approach the patient with, from the upper lip uh, in the oral mucosa, uh, point your needle to the upward direction and reach the uh, infraorbital foramen, which if you remember was lying a few centimeters below the infraorbital margin, right? Because we know that the V2 is the most commonly involved in case of trigeminal neuralgia. That's why infraorbital branch being a branch of the V2, that therefore we block this. Other uh, ways to alleviate the trigeminal neuralgia is surgical uh, removal of the trigeminal ganglion, other parts of the uh, trigeminal nerve. There are many uh, procedures that can be done to remove it 
to make person's life better all right another important clinical is the herpes zoster infection of the trigeminal nerve if an infection uh, from the virus called the herpes zoster affects the trigeminal nerve there will be vesicles in the distribution of this entire nerve so your face will be full of vesicles and the most important complication of this is because in the cornea uh, if these vesicles are formed the corneal ulceration can occur and eventually scarring of the cornea can occur which can actually interrupt with your vision now let's talk about the facial nerve it is the chief uh, uh, motor supply of your uh, face right uh, how do you test the facial nerve you just carry out the actions of the muscles you check out basically it has five branches which we've talked about uh, so if you want to check out the functions of all uh, what you'll do is first you'll start with the frontal region you'll ask the patient to look up without moving the head so the frowning expression of the frontalis will be produced second test you can do is you can ask the patient to close their eyes very uh, aggressively and you have to try to open the eyes but you they don't they're not allowed to let you open the eyes that we're basically checking the function of your uh, orbicularis ocular another test is that you can ask the patient to show the teeth because teeth can only be showed by the dilators of the mouth and these are supplied by the facial nerve and final thing you can do is ask the patient to whistle or make that blowing pouting face uh, because that is the action of buccinator and if the patient is unable to do any of these functions you know that the facial nerve is damaged now let's talk about these important regions of the facial nerve now what happens is facial nerve is the seventh cranial nerve it is coming from the pons pons is basically a part of the brain all right uh i just want you to remember this course because mostly it's about the neuroanatomy here uh i'm just gonna make it simple for you for now remember it, it comes from the pons it first becomes a geniculate ganglion uh, there is a corda tympani nerve is arising. Corda tympani is the function of the facial nerve, which is, is allowing to sense the taste in your anterior two thirds of the tongue. All right. And after the corda tympani, the facial nerve leaves the stylomastoid foramen uh, outside your cranium, right? So the course that we usually study of the facial nerve is outside the cranium because inside the cranium is mostly neuroanatomy, right? Uh, so basically what happens is, if there is any damage to the facial nerve before the geniculate ganglion, motor supply because the uh, facial nerve does motor supply and it gives the tear supply because to the lacrimal apparatus and it ha also gives your uh, taste supply via the corda tympani nerve, right? So all of these sensors will be gone. If there is a lesion to the facial nerve between geniculate but before the corda tympani emerging, all of these sensations will be gone. The only thing that will be spared is supply to the lacrimal apparatus. The tear forming will not be affected in this case. And finally, if the uh, facial nerve is damaged after the stylomastoid foramen, this stylomastoid foramen is lying at the region where there is the ear, there is parotid gland is coming over here. So uh, if there's any infection of the ear, if there is surgical removal of the parotid gland, so someone by mistake, uh, you know, uh, damage the facial nerve, or if there is any kind of infection over here uh, to the facial nerve by any virus, also any dental procedures can all lead to the uh, injury of the facial nerve after the stylomastoid foramen. The only function that will be lost is the motor function of the facial nerve. So if you're going to perform all those uh, facial nerve tests, you will uh, obviously get a positive the fact that they will not be able to form wrinkles on their forehead, they will not be able to whistle, they, all those functions will uh, be prevented. Commonly known as the Bell's palsy, the injury of the facial nerve after it leaves the tyromastoid foramen with resulting in motor paralysis of one side of the face is known as the Bell's palsy. Uh, what are the uh, symptoms and signs of this Bell's palsy you'll encounter? All of the functions are lost. So first thing, the patient won't be able to. Blinking eye is lost. So what will happen? The person's eye since tears won't be spread because blinking is lost the person's eye will have ulceration and tears will be falling down their face all right because tears are not affected they're going to be formed but they will not be going to the eye so they'll just be falling down the face if a person is trying to smile uh, the smile will rather lead into only one sided smile the side which is normal your lips your angle of the mouth will deviate towards the normal side whereas this side will be uh, depressed the third thing is that saliva will uh, drool from this side of the mouth, obviously, because the person is unable to close their mouth as well. When the patient will try to chew the food, the food will be left within between the cheek and the teeth, because obviously that's the function of buccinator muscle that it empties it. So that won't be done. So obviously food will be left in the mouth. So these are a couple of uh, signs of Bell's palsy, the common causes of the Bell's palsy we've discussed. Most likely it's also, it can also be idiopathic, meaning there is no cause found as to why the Bell's palsy is occurring. This is the face, it is divided into a right and a left half and an upper and a lower part. What's important is that all these parts are supplied by different fibers of the facial nerve. Now the facial nerve doesn't just begin uh, as it is, it has 
uh, it begins as nuclei and these nuclei of the facial nerve are getting supply from the cerebral cortex wait what is the cerebral cortex it's basically you can say it's a higher authority uh, the boss of the office is the cerebral cortex and facial nerve nuclei are the employees all right so let's look at the left nucleus first from the left side it supplies the left uh, half of the face the, the fibers separately go and supply the upper part of the left side of the face and then there are another separate area from where the fibers go to supply the lower part of the face the difference comes over here in how the cortex is going to supply the different facial nerve nucleus so since we're viewing the left side in the left side the right cortex gives fiber to the facial nerve nucleus for the upper part of the face and it also gives fibers to the lower part of the face of the left side so this is what is so interesting is that the right cortex fibers are giving left facial nucleus necessary fibers to supply the upper and lower parts of the face so basically your right cortex is representing your uh, left side of the face right and also the left side because it feels guilty for not giving any fibers to its own side what it does is it, sa it says that okay i'll give some fibers okay because i'm feeling bad so the left side of the cortex gives fibers only to the upper part of the face and this is the very important difference because now what happens is in case there is an upper motor neuron lesion slash supranuclear lesion what does that mean any upper motor neuron lesion or supranuclear lesion means any lesion there inside the brain so for instance it's on the right side of the brain there has been an upper motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve this is how the question will be framed now tell us what paralysis will occur since the fibers of the right side were giving both up upper and lower part of the face supply both of these are uh, damaged however due to the bilateral cortical representation of the fibers for the upper face because even the right cortex and the left cortex is also supplying this side of the face therefore the upper side of the face will be compensated and the paralysis will only occur on the contralateral lower side of the face so this is a very important difference and in case of a lower motor neuron lesion which means below the nucleus lesion infranuclear lesion what will happen is since both of these uh, will be damaged upper and lower fibers so that will be a direct lesion ipsilateral side of the face meaning if it, it's the lesion is on the left side then left side entire face will be paralyzed that's quite straightforward so i really hope this concept has made sense to you that is all you needed to know about the facial clinicals thank you so much for watching